Thank you for the introduction. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Rakshit from Max Planck Institute, uh, Germany. Uh, today I'll talk to you about our paper and author attribute anonymity by adversarial training of neural machine translation. It's a mouthful, so I won't say the name again. Uh, so this paper, we introduce a new model for automatic obfuscation of writing style. This is joint work with my colleagues, Bern Schiele and Mario Fritz. A person's writing style is uh, often strongly correlated with their attributes like age, gender, uh, educational background, etc. An adversary who has access to a piece of text written by an anonymous author can analyze this writing style and uh, using statistical models determine these private attributes. Th these attacks, often known as stylometry, is, uh, been, has been used uh, in many real world cases. Uh, more famously, uh, stylometry was used on the book A Cuckoo's Calling to determine that the original author is J.K. Rowling while Ms. Rowling had written the text, uh, the book under a pseudonym. So how do you defend against such stylometric attacks? Since the attacker only needs to access to the text itself, so uh, you, in order to defend against it, uh, you really need to modify the text to fool the attacker. So you, we can introduce a second model called obfuscator, which uh, takes the text you have written regenerates it such by making some modifications, for example, uh, adding some synonyms or changing punctuation styles so that adversary can no longer confidently predict what is the uh, original attribute. So while you do this resynthesis, you also want to preserve the meaning of the original text for it to be useful. So in this work, we present a new authorship obfuscation model, which we call as ANT. Uh, this model is a fully automatic model and it learns to do this obfuscation from data. So it uses the now infamous machine learning techniques to learn uh, which uh, uh, transformations are most effective and in order to fool the adversary while also uh, doing minimal changes so that the meaning of the sentence is preserved. And, uh, and does this obfuscation using imitation? So basically, if you want to uh, say obfuscate age, and you have classes like adult and teenager, you obfuscate by imitating the style of the other class. And you, we demonstrate this on three different uh, attributes, including age, gender, and identity. So how does this compare to prior work in obfuscation? So there are three main categories of work in automatic obfuscation. Uh, first class of models are uh, suggestive models, which analyze your text and give you suggestions to make some changes like uh, using a, a different phrasing or reducing counts of some particular letter and so on. But this requires the author to actually go back and rewrite the text and can be tedious. Uh, a second class of models use rule-based transformations, which uh, apply some fixed transformations to your text in order to make obfuscate it. However, again, these transformations are designed for a particular data set and when you move to it, they don't usually generalize well when you move to a different setting and needs re to be re-engineered. Another uh, final uh, uh, class of methods are using round trip translation. So you basically pass the text through multiple hops of translation, say from English to German, Spanish, and back to English. And uh, you hope that the style change which occurs through this translation steps is effective against obfuscation. But as is obvious, it's not optimized for obfuscation, so uh, it w doesn't work so well in all, all cases. In contrast, our model is fully automatic and it learns the transformations from data so it can be easily extended to different settings and doesn't need re to be re-engineered. And finally, it's also optimized for obfuscation. Uh, so how do we design this model? First, we start by noting the similarities between the task of automatic obfuscation and machine translation. So in machine translation, you're trying to take a text from input language to a target language, whereas in obfuscation, you'd want to take it from input style to a target style. So we should be able to reuse models designed for machine translation to train an automatic obfuscation system. Uh, right now, best machine translation models use neural networks. For example, Google machine translation is based on large neural networks. While these work quite well, you need a lot of training data to train these models. And you need paired training data. So by paired training data, I mean you need the same piece of text in, say, English and the same uh, meaning text in German. And you need millions such examples. However, this is not feasible in obfuscation setting because you can't 
get same piece of text written by multiple different authors uh, with pres while preserving the meaning. However, it's easy to get text which is written by, say, a lot of text written by adults and a lot of text written by teenagers. So can we learn to do this obfuscation automatically by using only unpaired training data? For this, we present our solution ANT. So it consists of the ANT network, which simply maps the input sentence to a target style. And then it, it learns to do this by uh, optimizing against three different loss functions. So first, you have the attribute classifier loss, which encourages ANT to change the style. Se second, you have the language model loss, which uh, encourages ANT to produce valid English sentences. And finally, you have a semantic consistency loss, which uh, encourages it to preserve the meaning of the original text. Let's try to understand why do you need all these three different loss functions and how they in, uh, interplay with each other. So uh, consider that the, this big rectangle on the uh, left or ri your right is uh, representing all possible word sequences. This includes valid English sentences and also random word or sequences. And let the smaller rectangle represent all valid English sentences. Now this is split into two parts. On the left, green dots showing all the adult written sentences and blue dots showing all the teenager ones. And let the red line show the classifier decision boundary. So this is the adversary's decision boundary which, by which he says all points to the left are in adult style and all to the right are in teenager style. So now if you want to transfer one such adult sentence into a teenager style, uh, which is shown in the big green dot, first you apply the attribute classifier loss, which uh, basically for, uh, teaches and to move this point across the decision boundary. However, while, while this ensures that the style has been transferred to the other side, it doesn't make sure that the sentence is still valid English sentence. So then you apply the language model loss, which now uh, reduces the solution space to uh, in intersection of teenagers' sentences and English sentences. So, uh, but this still doesn't ensure that the meaning of the original sentence is preserved. So for this, you again apply a semantic consistency loss, which further restricts the solutions to few teenager-style sentences, which will preserve the original sentence meaning. So this forms our final loss function, which is a weighted combination of these three. Uh, let's briefly look at how, uh, in a bit more detail, how these three loss functions are implemented. So uh, in order to transfer the style, ant is adversarially trained against an attribute classifier and uh, in a generative adversarial network framework. And so in this framework, attribute classifier f looks at the text generated by ant and tries to predict the original attribute. So if you're doing, say, if you want to go from teenager style to adult, you have an age classifier which is trying to predict the, that the text generated by ant is still in teenager style. Then ant, on the other hand, ant tries to fool this classifier by making it think that the text it generates is in adult style. And you train these models against each other. Uh, you optimize this until convergence. And uh, by at least from theory of GAN, you, you should have that at convergence point, and should mimic the target style perfectly. Uh, so a second loss function is the language smoothness loss, which encourages AND to produce valid English language sentences. We do this simply by having a pre-trained language model and using the likelihood of this language model. So you generate a text from AND and get it uh, get the likelihood estimate from the pre-trained model, and you maximize this. And finally, the uh, interesting part is how to preserve the semantic consistency. So in order to measure the semantic consistency between the input text and the transformed one, uh, we make use of the following assumption. So if you uh, make transformations to the text such that the meaning is preserved, you should be able to reconstruct the original sentence back. However, if you do some random transformations which destroy the meaning, you will not be able to reconstruct the original sentence. So we can use, make use of this fact and teach and to preserve the meaning by simply asking it to maximize the likelihood that you can reconstruct the original. So this is now a cyclic loss because you start from the input, you transform it, and then you try to reconstruct the original back. So it is, hence it's called a cyclic reconstruction likelihood and you maximize this and this encourages and to produce or preserve the meaning. So I, I, all, uh, I've skipped all the details of how the two networks are actually implemented. Which you can find this in the paper. So, th but uh, I presented you how to train this network. Now let's see if it's actually effective. And uh, I'll present you with the evaluation we conducted to uh, test this model in different settings. So uh, we trained, uh, we tested the model on two different uh, data sets. First is the blog authorship corpus, which 
is a large collection of uh, microblogs uh, with written by about 20,000 authors. And each of these authors have uh, anno been annotated for gender and age. Uh, we group the age annotation into two groups of adult and teenager, uh, with the age shown here. Uh, so this data set is uh, quite large with about 3 million sentences and it uh, has very natural or natural internet uh, language. So it has a lot of slangs and we, uh, funny punctuations. So it kind of forms a real use case for us and we use this as our primary evaluation data set. Uh, we also tested our model on a much smaller political speech data set. So this, for, we uh, collected tr transcripts of speech by Barack Obama and Donald Trump and try to uh, obfuscate the identities. So this data set is a quite difficult data set for obfuscation because the two authors have very distinct styles and also content in their speeches, and we uh, demonstrate the limits of the system using this data set. So here I present the evaluation in the age obfuscation setting. Uh, let me walk you through the graph. So we evaluate the uh, obfuscation performance along two axes. On the y-axis is the privacy effectiveness, and the x-axis is the semantic consistency. So we measure privacy effectiveness by simply seeing how well the adversary classified us on the obfuscated text. So if worse the adversary performance, better the privacy effectiveness. And here the red line shows the chance level performance of adversary. So above this line, adversary is only randomly guessing the actual age. And on the x-axis is the semantic consistency. We measure this using a metric called Meteor, which is commonly used in machine translation to uh, measure similarity between two sentences. So it's a value between 0 and 1, and 1 indicates perfect or a perfect match, and 0 is no, no overlap. So ideally, you want to be in the top right corner where you have perfectly retained the meaning of the sentence, but adversary cannot uh, is always guessing your age wrong. So let's start with the original text, which is shown in the uh, as a star symbol in the bottom right corner. So we can see that it is uh, the adversary performance on this is quite good. So adversary's uh, F1 score is at 0.85. So it means that it, uh, he, uh, adversary is able to correctly guess the age of the uh, author from the original text most of the time. So when you do obfuscation using uh, prior works, like using round trip translation with Google Translate or uh, using rule-based systems like uh, uh, Karadzo et al., uh, you see it uh, improves the effect privacy effectiveness only a little bit, but uh, there is a significant drop in uh, semantic consistency. Uh, in contrast, when you apply the ant obfuscation, the, you see the point moves up quite a bit, which indicates there is significant uh, adversary is no longer no longer able to determine the age. So it's moved beyond the chance level line. So it basically means adversary is only randomly guessing now what's the actual age. So we observed similar results on gender and identity obfuscation task, and the results are uh, presented in the paper. Uh, another aspect which we tested is for generalization. So, uh, in, so so far we have evaluated and against one particular adversary architecture. Now, the question is, is, does it learn only to fool this particular adversary, or does it generalize? So for this, we uh, created an experiment with 10 different adversary architectures using different architectures and hyperparameters. And uh, we, we measured the average performance of these adversaries. So, and we observed that, on average, all of these adversaries uh, perform worse than random guessing on the ant obfuscation. So it, in, it indicates, at least empirically, that the obfuscation learned by ant is uh, kind of generalizes to unseen classifiers and not just specific to the particular classifier we're trained with. So now I'll show you some uh, qualitative results. I'll show you three uh, categories of uh, results which to highlight the kind of changes ant learns. Uh, so here first class is the synonyms. So uh, uh, ant learns to re replace some words with their synonyms so that the meaning is preserved, but it alters the style. So for example, when you go from teenager to adult, and uh, it changes the sentence, and yeah, it's raining lots now, to and ooh, it's raining lots now. Uh, and we can note that this replacement is not always static, so it depends on the context. So in another context, yeah, is, yeah it's going OK here, too. It's changed with alas, it's just going OK here, too. So uh, and it's not just single word replacement. In, uh, when you go from adult to teenager, it changes funnily enough to haha besides. So 
Uh, second class of uh, qualitative results, uh, second class of transformations, it learns are replacing slangs with proper English words and vice versa. So uh, when you go from teenager to adult, you ch it changes, I don't know why, with a single why. Uh, I, went, I went into this relationship to I don't know why I e even went into another relationship. So uh, it's replacing uh, different spellings and also uh, replacing slangs with a proper English word. Uh, and in the second case, when you go from adult to teenager, it replaces, okay, think, I really will go to bed now to, okay, realized, I really will. I think this is a spelling mistake version of re realized. So we, we can see that it's learning these transformations uh, which are kind of unusual. So it would be hard to encode this in a rule-based system because you need to enumerate all spelling variations, spelling mistakes, and uh, slangs a priori. However, here the system has looked at the training data and figured out these transformations. And finally, uh, uh, another class of changes it makes are altering the semantics. So these are kind of failure cases and usually happens in, uh, uh, in difficult examples where the input text semantics are heavily biased towards one class. So for example, if the sentence is talking about going to school, you, it's very likely that it's written by a teenager. Or when it's uh, talking about seeing clients or wife, it's very likely written by an adult. So in, in these cases, the model learns to replace these words, which alters the semantics a little bit, but uh, protects the privacy, at least fools the classifier. So uh, as an example, after school, I got my haircut, it's changed to after all I have my haircut. And uh, when you go from adult to teenager, it changes. I tell my wife how much I love her, to I tell my crush how much I love her. So you can push this to the extreme and try to uh, do obfuscation on uh, uh, political speeches of Obama and Donald Trump. So uh, this yeah. uh, this is a difficult case uh, because the two uh, authors have a very distinct uh, content and, and style variation in the speech. So the model finds it hard to distinguish which is the content part and which is the style since there is, and this is also kind of uh, exaggerated by the fact that it's a bit smaller data set than the blog authorship corpus. So in this setting, when you, uh, here I show some examples when you uh, go from Barack Obama to Trump style, it uh, changes, say we can do this with we will do this, and I'm going to need your help is changed to I'm going to fight for your country, and finally their situation is getting worse with their media is getting worse. So these are, uh, yeah, so this kind of shows the limitations of uh, this learning directly from the data where uh, if you have uh, very distinct styles between the two authors with small amount of data, then it's hard to separate out the style and content. So in, in conclusion, uh, we presented a new uh, authorship obfuscation framework called ANT. Uh, and it uses uh, deep learning techniques to learn to perform obfuscation directly from the data, So, which is a departure from prior work. Because of this, uh, we can easily extend this to different or apply this on different settings uh, without needing much re-engineering. So we demonstrated this by uh, training this on uh, age, gender, and identity obfuscation. And finally, more Im I think more importantly, it learns to do this by using only unpaid data. So you only need uh, lots of text written by adult and teenagers, but not necessarily the same piece of text. So we think this, uh, in a lot of settings, it's quite easy to obtain unpaired data compared to obtaining actually paired data. So we believe this will uh, kind of, this makes this method a bit more generic and uh, we should be able to apply this to other settings where there's only unpaired, unpaired data. Thank you for listening. Uh, I'm open to questions. Let's thank the speaker. All right, so Rachel. Hi, um, Rachel Greenstadt Drexel. Hi. Uh, really nice work. I'm, I'm super excited to see this. But um, I'm curious what happens if you've um, experimented with looking at when you, um, like when you train, if you have a small identity set, right, mm -hmm. and you train this person to look like a different person, but then you, but then you take that and you use a different suspect set, does it look, you know, is it still, does it still fold or is it overfit to the original distractor set? Because that mm -hmm. was a problem that we found with an on a mouth that we had. Okay. Uh, um, 
I think uh, so we trained this on assuming uh, like known attribute classes beforehand. So right. So like, it's mostly attributes rather than identity. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's only so far done on binary uh, setting. So you have two values for attributes usually. So uh, kind of to extend it to, I think uh, before we are able to apply this to kind of multi-class uh, multi setting, uh, there needs to be a bit more work uh, in uh, this is kind of this work is similar to what's happening now in image uh, style transfer, and there there is a limitation that usually it's kind of one style to the other, only binary mapping, right? right. So uh, to go from multi-class to multi-class, I think there is uh, some more bottlenecks in how these models learn, and that I think prevents it. So uh, at, at this point, at least, but I'm hopeful it will be fixed. Okay, thanks. Um, Kevin from the University of Chicago, where nice work. So I have a little bit uh, technical question. So um, you generated the text using the GAN, generative mm -hmm. adversary NES, right? Um, so it has been used a lot in image domain. But mm -hmm. however, in a text domain, one problem is the text is not differentiable. Right. So the most of techniques in the AMERIC community, they leverage um, basically the reinforcement learning with right. policy gradient. So I'm wondering what's your trick to address this non-differentiability problem? Right. So uh, for this, we use, uh, so uh, the problem is when you sample words, it's discrete and you can't do back propagation yeah, anymore. Yeah. So for this, uh, there is, uh, one option is using reinforcement learning, like you said, but we use this uh, method called uh, Gumbel softmax approximation. So it's basically a way to s get soft samples instead of discrete samples fr from this, uh, when you sample from the vocabulary. And once you get the soft samples, you kind of can feed it as the input to the next layer and you can do back propagation. Uh, these details are in the paper, so it, uh, it's similar to how you would do uh, train VAEs, where you have discrete uh, codes and you use this reparameterization. So this is a reparameterization for this multi, uh, for this uh, multinomial sampling. So uh, yeah, we could talk about this later. Okay. Uh, another uh, quick follow-up question is: Have you done any uh, systematic study about the readability of the generated text? Like, is it really readable, or like any like grammar broken between mm -hmm. sentences? So we did a, a human evaluation. Uh, basically, showed people the input text and the uh, uh, generated text, and to ask if it's uh, preserving the meaning. So, but this is kind of expensive, so we did this only on a sm much smaller set than the result shown here. So uh, in there, uh, at least, uh, and we compared it to uh, like along 0 to 5 scale and also compared it to the machine translation. So on 0 to 5, I think uh, it got a score of about 4, uh, which it says in most of the cases it preserves the meaning, but uh, in some cases the meaning is altered. So, but yeah, uh, ideally you should do this on a bit larger scale to get better idea about that. Thank you very much. Hi, this is Shakur. I'm from NYU. Great talk. Totally look forward to like reading the paper and understanding more about the details. I was wondering, so when you take an uh, individual, so say you showed the example of converting Donald Trump's style into Obama's mm -hmm. style or vice versa, sorry. So did you try to check for accuracy on like just style checking? the converted text as to how much it referred to the original speaker. So say if you converted Trump to Obama, mm -hmm. and then you checked Obama for Obama's writing style on itself using authorship classification, how did that play out if you'd looked into that? Uh, you mean if we used the classifiers on the transformed text? Classifier on the right. transformed text, yes, Yeah, so uh, it quite easily fools the classifier. So it gets the classifier accuracy from like high 90s to 0%. No, like. Yeah. The classified text, like the converted text, so mm -hmm. the one you converted to, did you try to check that particular person's um, writing style on the converted text? Say so if you converted it into Obama, right. did you try to check it for Obama style on your converted text? Yeah, so using a classifier, right? So we use the style classifier mm -hmm. on top of the uh, converted text, and uh, it's able to fool the classifiers quite easily. The challenge is more in preserving the meaning of the sentence. I'll follow yeah. up. I'll follow <laughs> Maybe up. I didn't Sorry. quite get the question. Maybe one quick question. Hi, uh, I really enjoyed the talk. Um, one question I had is whether you've thought about how effective a human is at consciously obfuscating the own, their own text 
Um, so say, for example, I want to, I'm a blogger, I have a lot of stuff associated with my name, but I want to publish some post and make mm -hmm. sure nobody knows it's me. Maybe it's easier just for me to change around my wording or my sentence structure mm -hmm. consciously. Um, so I, I, I don't know, is that something that a human could try to do but wouldn't be very effective at because there's something else that a computer could still detect? Uh, uh, as far as I know, there was a study about this uh, quite long ago uh, where they asked people to rewrite the text in order to fool the uh, classifier. I think uh, it, it needs the humans to be trained a little bit to do this. Uh, I think, uh, and to kind of, you need to keep, tell them beforehand what are the markers to look out for uh, in order to be effective. I think if you just give uh, kind of a layperson and say, change your style, uh, to a different one, I think it's a bit more difficult. Uh, but I, I can't remember the details of the study very well. Okay. <laughs> so um, it was in 2012, and we did find that people were pretty effective. I mean, we haven't checked against the most recent mm -hmm. uh, methods, but even untrained, if, okay. you them, if, you them, if you told them to imitate another style, mm -hmm. in particular, they were pretty pretty good at it, even, okay. if, even if they were like untrained people. Okay. Thanks. Let's thank the speaker.